Welcome to the fourth Sunday in Advent. As you can see here, all four candles are lit. And we thank you for our newest acolyte who is helping us. Let's welcome with our hands. Thank you so much. for that. <laughs> We're three out of four to go. We have one more to go. And um, this is exciting for the girls. Uh, but this is exciting. Now as we come to, to, to Tuesday night, our Christmas Eve services, we'll light the white candle. And so let us begin with prayer. Gracious Father, as we now enter the fourth week of Advent, to prepare ourselves to give thanks for the salvation that you brought forth through the first Christmas. And now the rest of the Christmas is to get us ready for the second Advent. Lord, we have a lot on our plates this morning, and so Lord, help to put that aside and clear our ears and our minds and take our hearts to soften us this morning. The great joy of what Christmas is all about. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, every, every Advent theme, depending on the church and the pastor and the spiritual theme, is that now today the text is Joseph. And so Joseph, we don't hear really hear about two items, two stories about Joseph. One is today and then when he takes his son and his family to Jerusalem and when um, Jesus was 12 years old. And so we look at Joseph today, and there's a cute little story about two boys wanting the part of the Christmas play of Joseph. And they are just arch enemies in their class, in their Sunday school class. And so as the teacher picked, she picked the other one for Joseph. And so the one that didn't get Joseph became the innkeeper. And he was very upset. Very frustrated. And so, here he is. So he planned the whole time what to do as we get to the story. When Joseph and Mary came to the end, there, there the innkeeper had it all planned what he was going to do to mess up Joseph's line. Because he wanted the star of the play. And so when Joseph and Mary knocked on the door, he opened it up and he says, what do you want? He goes, well, Joseph said, my wife is pregnant. We need a place to stay. Do you have a room? And then there is pause. And then all of a sudden, the innkeeper smiled and opened the door wide open. Yes, we have plenty of room. Come on in. And Joseph didn't know what to do. And he looked to his right and looked to his left. And he's debating what? This is not in the play. And then he looked around and he goes, No wife of mine are going to live in this inn. Come on, honey, we're going to the barn. <laughs> Joseph, trying to do the right thing. Could you imagine being Joseph? I mean, here he is. He's excited about a new family he's going to have. He's engaged to marry. And then all of a sudden, the big news. She's pregnant. And he knows that's not his child. Boy. Sleepless nights panic, stress. We've all been there, but we've received news that just turned our world upside down. His whole plan, his whole dream of his family and raising a family, and that was so huge to have a family and children, and, and all of a sudden, now he's becoming a laughing stock of his town and his family. And Mary is, she talks about seeing an angel and, and all this stuff. And he's just, you can imagine what he was going through. But it's kind of cool as Matthew starts the gospel. He begins with, if you turn to chapter 1, it's amazing what he starts talking about from Abraham all the way down to Joseph. As he reminds Joseph and us today what kind of family Joseph has come from and the family we've come from. Because all our families, none of our families are perfect. And we'd be in the tabloids. If we lived in Europe and London, all those newspapers, all they do is just incredible dysfunctional families. And what they do, all of our families could be on the front page. But it's kind of interesting, as Joseph, as he remembers the stories from his Sunday school class about all these great people, Abraham, 
<laughs> Isaac, Jacob, were dysfunctional like us today. Abraham, he was no perfect person. He said, he, he said, uh, Pharaoh, that his wife is his sister to protect, he thought, his own skin. And Isaac did the same as he followed his father's sins. And that's just one of many sins that all these patriarchs created in their lives. And it goes down, Jacob, the great deceiver. Yes, he deceived not only his brother, but his parents, his dad. And then he got deceived by his uncle Laban. And it just continues. You have Judah, all right? Judah the great, the, the, the one tribe of all the 12 tribes that Jesus will come through. He, in his sins, as his daughter-in-law deceived him, Tamra, as her husband passed away. And, and the, the rule there back then is that the next son would take over his brother's wife, but he wanted nothing to do with it. So Tamra tricked her father-in-law she could be pregnant. She's on that list of descendants of Jesus. All these are misfits, you know. And you continue, there's Rahab. There's four women in that chapter one of Matthew, of all the great men, all sinners as well. But Rahab had a job that was sinful. But she's in the line. We talked about Ruth a couple Wednesdays ago. Thank you, Barbara, for doing Ruth. And Ruth was a foreigner, not even Jewish blood. And she's in the line of Jesus, Joseph. So you can see. And then you have a lady that's not even mentioned. You have King David, the great King David, but he was a mythic, as he had his sinful nature as well. And then it says, the wife of Uriah. You guys remember the wife of Uriah. Interesting, they mention the man who David killed to get his wife. And then, so Bathsheba's not even mentioned. But here it is, all these mythics to go all the way down to Joseph. Could you imagine, as Joseph's trying to put this together, what am I going to do? Is that here is nobody's perfect. But to help Joseph and us today is, we look at our Christmas, we look at our, our Christian lives or our earthly lives, and I know we, nothing is perfect. We're all misfits. In fact, there's a popular song that was a myth, misfit that now has become number two in the Christmas season. Kind of interesting. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is said to be the only 20th century addition to Santa Claus' story. He was the last of all the reindeers that were mentioned. Maybe, you know, the Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen and Comet and Cupid and Donner and Blitzen. Rudolph only turned a little bit over 70 years old this year. You know this story. There was once was a reindeer was teased by other reindeers because of his bright big red nose. But he saved Christmas one foggy night when his nose became a beacon that guided Santa's sled. Over, just over a hundred years ago, Montgomery Wards remembered them. Gave copies of a poem, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, to customers for their children. It was an enormous success. The story gave way more than six million copies over the years. In 1946, Montgomery Wards, you guys remember Montgomery Wards, a store? <laughs> Transfer the copyright to the poem back to the writer, Robert May, who worked for the department store when he wrote it in 1939. May, who had a sick wife and six children put, to put through school, sold the rights to the children's book publisher within a month. The book sold more than 100,000 copies. Then in 1949, a New York songwriter by the name of Johnny Marks, a friend of May's, wrote the song based on the poem. It took months to convince anyone to record the song, and when he pitched it to a cowboy actor by the name of Gene Archery, anyone remembers him. He turned it down, Gene, but his wife convinced him to record the song. Archery then recorded Rudolph only as a B-side in which he thought it would be a hit 
Christmas tune, his title and his song, If It Doesn't Snow on Christmas. Does anybody remember that song? <laughs> but everybody knows his other side of the record, Rudolph. When he sang that song for the first time at live Madison Square Garden concert in September 1949, by Christmas the sales were over 2 million. It was now sold more than 100 million copies, making it second only to White Christmas of the most favorite. Kind of interesting. Misfits. Dysfunctional family. Christmas is not having a perfect Christmas, but having a perfect Savior for us dysfunctional misfits in life. And you can imagine as Joseph trying to start a perfect family, finds out his wife is pregnant, it's not his, and now, after who knows how long, that he just decided, I'm going to have to send her quietly away and start over. What a blessing. How many times would we have to start over if we want a perfect life? No. Jesus comes. He came to Joseph through the angel and says, this is the game plan. This is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to save our sins, all the sins from Abraham, all your relatives, and you, Joseph, and us today. Powerful. Jesus means he saves. Emmanuel means God is with us. And so often in our earthly life, we want to be politically correct. We want to have the perfect life or whatever it is. If it's not working out, we want to run away and erase it. But God comes running after us. He says, this is why I've come, to be with you, Emmanuel. To walk with you and to help you and to guide you. Pretty powerful. One of the great hymns called the Messiah is powerful. And the author of this of this incredible musical that we celebrate and we read was by George Frederick Handel. Handel was beside himself with great troubles. His health, his fortune had reached the lowest. His right side had become paralyzed. All his money was gone. His creditors seized him and threatened him with imprisonment. For a brief time he was tempted to quit, to give up the fight. But then, like Joseph, his obedience to God welled up within him and rebounded to compose the greatest work called the epic Messiah. The second part, which ends wondrously, was the powerful Alleluia Choir. It's interesting how music and stories happen in poems is when we're at our worst, God becomes at his best. And so here's Joseph. Wanting to do the right thing. But if he looked in his family line, we always mess it up. But God takes an incredible mess up and makes it into a wonderful thing. And came to Joseph to be bold, to be strong, to take our mishaps and doing the Christ thing of love and forgiveness and have a courageous spirit. I want to finish with another story as we close. A rancher by the name of Lexi in Montana was having trouble with coyotes, killing her sheep. She used electric fences, odor spray, even tried placing battery-operated radios near them. She tried corralling them at night and hurting them by day, but nothing worked. In one year, she lost over 50 of her sheep. Finally, Lexi purchase some llamas, aggressive, funny-looking animals, which mostly dwell in South America. She put them in with the sheep, and they graze alongside them. Llamas are fearless. They aren't afraid of anything. When they see something different, they put their heads up, and they walk straight towards it, trying to figure out what it is. They're not scared. And as Christians, even though we get scared in difficulties, we have an amazing Christmas gift. We're going to face problems and challenges the rest of our lives. What are we going to do? 
Are we going to be first Joseph and try to put it aside secretly and run away? Or through the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is suffering and resurrection, are we able to put our heads up and slowly start heading to the problem and let God, who's with us, guide us through us? Christmas arms us with the courageous spirit. Look at our past. We've messed it up pretty good. But Jesus has made us perfect. And we've got an awesome future. We can't mess it up. Because God is with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time.